Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here, and in this video we're going to talk about natural selection, or one of the major mechanisms that are involved in evolution. And so evolution is characterized by changes in the genetic makeup of a population over time, and is supported by multiple lines of evidence, and we're really going to be focusing in on the mechanism that's associated with evolution, as outlined by Charles Darwin, and that has been supported over the last 150 plus years since the publication of origin of species. All right, so one of the key things when we talk about natural selection is that there are several key components in the mechanism of natural selection. One of the ideas is that all populations are going to have some degree of variation within their population initially. We also know that there's going to be an overproduction of offspring each generation. So more individuals will be produced than could possibly survive in a given environment. And then we also know that not all of those individuals, because of variation, are going to be able to survive equally to one another. So some will be better off at surviving and others will be less better off at surviving. And that reproduction leads to passing on certain traits. And so all of these factors come together that lead to natural selection. So when we see natural selection as that major mechanism, we look at and say, when we see a population at, at a given time, we say, how did that population change over time? We will notice that the modern day versions of any organism that we look at has undergone constant tinkering through the variation that existed in ancient populations, and then the varying degrees of success that were found in those populations over time as different selective pressure was applied. And so we look at modern day species as a result of the mechanisms of evolution. So according to Darwin's theory of natural selection, it's really important that we talk about competition for limited resources in the different survival. Individuals with more favorable phenotypes are more likely to reproduce over time offspring are then going to have traits that allow them to survive. So for example, here we have two populations that are evolving in response to each other. We have a group of mice and we have a group of owls. Now it turns out that in this area, the, the soil tends to be fairly dark. And so there's also the ability of some owls to have a exceptional ability to see which is signified by that eye here. We call those the better seeing owls. And so what we see is that initially we have the, the mice and we have the owls and there's competition amongst the owls to get mice and there's competitions amongst the mice to survive and avoid owls. In the first few generations, we see a shift in mouse population where the white mice are selected against, the darker mice survive and reproduce. And over time, we see a shift in those dark gray mice. As that mouse population shifts, it turns out that eventually the owls that are not as good at seeing, start to struggle to get enough energy. And over time, that's going to provide a selective pressure back on the owls, such that we see an increase in owls that have this exceptional ability to see in order to survive and reproduce over time. All right, so we see these key components, and we again would assume that both the coloration in these mice and this visibility, uh, the ability to see in the uh, owls are going to be heritable traits that are passed on to the generations over time. Now, if we explain how this leads to differences in populations, what it means is that at some point there was uh, some degree of variance in a population and there are going to be all sorts of different offspring that are produced. But because of the selective mechanism that occurs within that population, only some are going to be able to survive and reproduce. It is a very competitive environment to both gain resources and avoid all of the things that could cause death of individuals. And so what we see is that populations tend to have, on average, more individuals that have the best traits to survive in a given particular environment, and then fewer that are going to be out on the edge, particularly if resources are scarce. As resources become more scarce, those individuals that are on the periphery that don't have the best selected traits are actually going to be far less frequently seen within populations. So what we can see is that evolutionary fitness can be measured based off of reproductive success. So if what we find is that at one point we have a group of moths that are mostly light colored, but then later on we see that we have moths that are mostly dark colored, this implies that there was an evolutionary fitness to having darker wing color and that led to more success of dark colored moths over time. And that would be in this instance because of selection by predators who could initially during the time where there was less pollution, 
they could more easily see the dark moths, but after a period of pollution, they could more easily see the white moths. All right, so we know that biotic and abiotic environments can be more or less stable or have more or less fluctuation, and this affects the rate and the direction of evolution. Different genetic variations can be selected in each generation. And so what we tend to find is that you will have populations and that depending on a the stability of a an environment or the fluctuation of that environment, we may see shifts over time. And so what we will find, in, you know, one of the classic examples that we see here on the bottom is that, you know, we have this distribution here where there's an initial mean that it's small and then over time we see a mean that is larger and there's less individuals over in the population. This could very easily be used to talk about things like the beak size of finches in the Galapagos before a drought and then after a drought, where after the drought there were fewer smaller seeds, only large harder seeds, and therefore only those individuals who had uh, very large beaks were able to get enough energy by cracking those seeds with their large beaks in order to survive and reproduce. And so the environment, whether it's stable or fluctuating, is going to provide the selective pressure to determine which individuals are most suited to survive. In this case, we see a fluctuating or changing environment, and therefore over time we're going to see a change in the distribution of some traits within that population. Now, it's also important to know that variation, when we talk about this, we're really talking about the variation as seen in polygenic traits, traits that have multiple genes that contribute to those phenotypes. So when we see a distribution curve like these, what we're seeing is we're seeing normal distribution and variation of a trait based off of multiple genes contributing. It is entirely possible, like in our peppered moth example, that we have two forms, a light form and a dark form, and it's a simple Mendelian trait of two separate colors. And if that's the instance, uh, we'll just have a two bar bar graph that's going to show our phenotypic variation. In either instance, certain phenotypes are going to be able to survive better than others in the environment, depending on the size of pressure. And if the environment changes, you may see shifts in the population. So again, natural selection acts on phenotypic variation, as we mentioned before. Uh, it is really important to note that no population is going to be exactly the same for all traits. Even bacteria that have very low variation will have some degree of variation that comes out through mutations. Obviously, sexually reproducing species are going to have greater variation as you're going to have uh, more opportunities to create variation through their reproduction. And that what we can see is that anytime you see a population that has variation, depending on how difficult it is to survive and reproduce in their given environment, you're going to see some survive and some not survive. And if there's a really high competition to either get resources or to avoid certain conditions in the case of a predator-prey relationship, you're going to end up seeing shifts in that population over time. Now, one of the other things to know is that the environment does play a selective role, and we've talked about this in a few different examples. And one of the classic examples we often like to talk about is the rock pocket mice. These are found in the southwest of the United States. And in this case, there's two common variants, a darker variant and a lighter brown variant. And depending on where these mice are found, either in the darker area or the lighter area of these lava flows, you will find different environment applying different pressures on these mice. And so in the darker areas, the darker mice are better able to avoid predators and they survive and reproduce more successfully. So if you go into the darker areas and you collect mice, you're actually going to find, um, on average, the higher allele frequency of the dark mouse genes and more dark mice in that area. If you move just a handful of feet outside into the lighter brown um, area and you collect mice there, you're going to find more light mice and fewer dark mice. This does not mean that you're going to find no light mice in the dark lava flows and no dark mice in the brown lava flows. It's just we're going to see that this the selective pressure in the environment is going to put pressure on those populations so that the average trait is going to be better matched for their environment. So some other things to know about phenotypic variation is that they increase or decrease in the different particular environments. And this is your, again, your classic example. If you were to go and collect all of the dark mice that were found in that light brown area and move them over to the darker areas, they're actually going to have a much greater chance of surviving and reproducing than they are in the dark area. So environment plays a huge role on what traits are going to be fit and allow organisms to survive and reproduce. 
All right, so that was a very quick overview of natural selection. Hopefully you have a good understanding of the mechanisms and you know some several examples. And I will talk to everybody soon.